you last year, and he's, um, he's um, an active member of the uh, Perry uh, Project Advisory Committee. Um, again, thank you very much for, be, for, for your time and for being with us today. Please give a warm welcome to uh, Charlie. Uh, well, thank you very much. Good to see some old friends. If I look as if I've just stopped, stepped off a long haul flight, I have. That's why I'm a little bit washed out. Um, Okay, um, I suspect you've heard all the stuff you want to hear already, and I'm sure Gonzalez here will use some of my slides, but let's see how we get on. I thought I'd just take some observations from the viewpoint of experience. How did I get into, um, into this whole game? Well, I was appointed uh, chief executive of one of the research councils in the UK, and this was the main laboratory we had in the UK, based outside of Oxfordshire. I'd come from a small lab where i have been dean of engineering at uh, Nottingham University, and suddenly I was plunged into this, and I knew absolutely nothing about it whatsoever. Um, and suddenly you find within days you're at international meetings negotiating international treaties, talking about particle physics, about which I knew nothing, um, talking about even uh, about lasers, and in the laser institute, and we'll know about Vulcan and uh, uh, the other lasers it at the other for that from lab. And then I had to be in charge of building that ring shaped thing at the back there, which is the UK synchrotron diamond, mere 253 million euros. Um, you learn by doing it, and you learn by making a lot of mistakes in this game. And don't worry about it too much, most of us survive. Probably the most significant building there, uh, I've got a point with me, is uh, this one here, and that road. Because that links that laboratory to the worldwide internet, uh, internet system. It's at the moment at 10 gigs down that road, and that is the UK's biggest civilian data store, being the tier one center for, uh, oh, thanks a lot. Uh, being the tier one center for CERN and all the uh, space experiments. So that's one view of what an infrastructure looks like. It happened to be the one I was pulled up on, as it were. Uh, you mentioned the European Research Area Board, and this was our first report that came out two years ago called Preparing Europe for a New Renaissance. Many of us were realizing the whole nature of research, whatever field, arts, humanities, social sciences, as well as hard physical sciences, was changing. And this is what the Commissioner wrote in that report. This is Commissioner Potopnik. Uh, and it's about, there are global challenges. We've got to do something about this. I often quoted these talks, a poet called Edwin Muir, who in the, just at the end of the Second World War wrote, the world's great day is growing late. The world's great day is growing late. And indeed it is. We've heard a bit about that this morning. There are big issues that affect us all wherever we want, and we need to mobilize all talents, wherever they are, to actually take part in it. And I think it's very important here, because it's part of the question that came up, we must rethink the way science interacts with politics and society at large. And we talk in this report about a social contract between researcher and society. Very interesting. But also, too, it's very easy just to bury your head in the sand and say, well, it won't happen to me, I'll just go on. The world of research and learning is changing. We still need the bottom-up ideas. You've got Einstein of uh, South Africa. Great, go for it. Um, I hope you recognize him or her when you see it. <laughs> it's not always that easy. Um, uh, but pretty unmanageable as well. Uh, so, good. Um, so do we have to look at the way we train our researchers, the PhDs? I say here, should we actually rethink what the PhD was. One of those slides that you showed of the graduation ceremony, I noticed at a PhD from Cambridge, because I have the same gown. Uh, but that was, <coughs> the PhD in Cambridge was started less than 100 years ago. It needs to morph into something a little bit more realistic than it is now. And we need these research infrastructures, because they are the thing that are driving much of what's going on. Now, I, uh, this comes from the first S3 roadmap, just showing that everything depends on research infrastructures. They drive an awful lot of things, and we'll see that as we go through. Not only does, as we saw with the Meerkat and volunteer, the industry, but it also hits education, the universities themselves, the innovation agenda, new ideas will come about as a result of it. It impacts the local society. When that diamond synchrotron was built, the number of students studying science in and around that area doubled. 
because they could see the investment was going in. So don't think it's just a bit of kit sitting there. It has major impact. Uh, well, you heard about the first S3 roadmap. Uh, it was October 19, 558, in the, in the evening when 27 hands plus the commission put their hand up. And don't forget too here, this is not an EC driven project. S3 is a member state activity and not all countries, in fact, no countries sign up to every project. They take a pick and miss. And the money for putting up the research infrastructures comes entirely from the member states, not from the commission. The commission helped by putting together the preparatory phase funds and a little bit for transnational access, nothing else. It's the member states that make the decisions, not the commission. The commission might like to, but they don't have that remit, and they will not have that remit. So we talk about a um, chessboard of opportunities. They're all there. Which ones do you want to sign up to? And we see how they get on. Now, there are four types of international research infrastructures. There's the big ones. I had to put the FAA up there, didn't I? Um, I had visited Australia again this year as well, so you I'm now, well, I have two visitors to South Africa and one to Australia, so I don't know one's Australia keeps me going. I have no say in the decision where it goes. Anyway, well, people think I have, but I uh, but, um, Then there's the dispersed physical ones, such as the synchrotrons. There's a whole host of them, and there are funds available from the Commission to allow access for people who don't uh, have their own facility. Then there are the virtual ones, the sort of biobanks and things like that. And then there's the fourth one, which I think is extremely interesting, called data infrastructures. And these are things like social surveys uh, and, and the like. And I'll talk a lot about that, because I think that is the one that we perhaps ignore. Well, here are some of the ones on that roadmap in the uh, social sciences and humanities. You don't think of social sciences and humanities having research infrastructures. They do. They really do. And here's one that I like to talk about, which is Clarin, which is a language resource initiative, which is using semantic web uh, annotation to actually say what does a word mean in context? What does the word, I don't know, table mean in the context of South Africa, in the context of a human doc, in, in, in the context of a document which may be legal or it may be literature? There'll be connotations, and then if you go back to philosophy, of course, you know, what is a table? Is it, does it have to have four legs? And so on. These are the questions that have been asked. What is the context in which that happens? Now, you may say this is absolutely relevant. It isn't absolutely relevant when you come to international trade agreements and legally binding international uh, contracts. People running it, of course, are medieval German scholars. They didn't realize the impact of what they were doing, but the impact is immense. And here it is, this is what it is. It, at the moment, it's purely European, but the day that roadmap came out, I was spoken by China, Chile, Brazil, and America to discuss this project. They saw the importance of it. One of the challenges in it, and this is, we talk about glibly about research infrastructures, you've got to make them work. Uh, how do you actually get people to get involved with them? First of all, there's a group, as I said, of people who are generally uh, humanists who have not really worked together. So how do you get them to take it out? They have no knowledge of the technology. They have to trust it. They use the uh, 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 Max Planck Linguistics Institute in Nijmegen with Peter Bittenberg, who was originally an electrical engineer. He is the guy who is the brains and putting the guts into this project to allow the researchers to do it uh, and making them aware, giving them uh, in, in impetus to go forward. Then there are the legal challenges. These are not to be underestimated. I'll talk about one I had to bring forward. Uh, it took five years to get the legal bit sorted out. That's one reason the UEC has developed a thing called an ERIC, which is a framework which allows the legal issues to be thrashed out much more easily. Then there are special problems about what do you do about, this is my data, I'm not going to give it to you. What do you do about those sorts of things? What do you do about privacy and ethical issues? And the rest? There's lots and lots of issues you don't know that are there when you start this game. The area of environmental sciences was a big one, uh, and these were some of the projects on the original roadmap. The one I like to look at because it has a real impact on all the world, but especially here in Africa, is about biodiversity research, because biodiversity is a whole earth problem. You can't just look at one bit in isolation. You've got to do the whole thing. And so you can do a bit in Europe, but that's irrelevant if nothing has been looked at in other parts of the world, and you have to bring it all together. And so here we are. These are some of the uh, components of this infrastructure. A load of people um, uh, make, make measurements in different ways, whether in the sea or greenhouse gas, uh, tectonic plates or bugs and flowers and things in collections. 
And why is it important? Because you've got to collect the data from somewhere. And you can collect the data now on your mobile phone. Just go out into the fields here. You see something you haven't seen before, it flowers a day or two earlier. Click, bring GPS, and your, your data then goes up to space. And it's dumped down into CERN, because that's where uh, the, uh, the data processing is occurring. Irrelevant where you are. You are now, if you want to be, there's an application you can have on your phone. You can be part of this. And so the analysis is done in CERN, and there's some magic annotation done elsewhere. And suddenly, the researchers can actually access this data. Exciting, isn't it? This is all about cyber democracy, about science democracy. Anybody can take part in these things. So suddenly, you open up the whole vision of what science and research can do. I think that's exciting. And this links into several of the other projects that are in the, in the SV roadmap, such as Elixir, which is probably the biggest research infrastructure when looking at the future of genomics. The one I had dealings with, which was this one, was the X-ray free electron laser in Germany. And it's very simple. It just happens to be three and a half kilometers long, costing 1.2 billion euros at um, uh, 2005 prices, probably going to end up more like 2 billion. And basically, it's a, an X-ray movie camera. That's what it does. It's a billion times brighter uh, than existing synchrotrons, but the important thing is it has a time resolution of a million billion per second. <coughs> You get, a date, you get a million data points every million billionth of a second. A lot of data, and there are five beam lines when it's completed. There are three of these around the world. The first one just started in California, and there's one in uh, Japan. Um, this is what it looks like, just to show you that this is a schematic. This is Hamburg, this is Chelsea Kolstein, and now they're about two thirds of the way down this tunnel. Twelve countries involved, and others are going to join in the near future as well. Very exciting project. And the question was initially, would it work? Can you blast a protein molecule or a, uh, or a virus, such as just one molecule, uh, with this beam that's so intense that it destroys the molecule? The answer was earlier in February, this is the first paper in Nature said, yes, you can. So 12, 10 years ago, we took the risk and analyzed our risky that it would, might not work. And that, oh, sorry, this is the one way around. That was the modeling that was done to show that you should be able to get the data out before you destroy the model. This will revolutionize biology and drug delivery. So whilst you think of it as a big exosource, what is the impact on society and industry? But this is the killer. It's the amount of data that will be created when it goes live in 2016. 200 petabytes of data. If that means nothing to you, in old money, a petabyte of data is a kilometer high of the CDs. 200 kilometers high of CDs. We were working out, if you did all the SV projects, how quickly you get to the moon. The CDs piled up on each other. I forgot how long it was. It was only about four years. It, it, so this is a real issue, because these data are for all sorts of different experiments, whether it's environmental sciences, biology, magnetism, or whatever. It's all there, and you don't have time or the algorithms to sort it all out. Unlike CERN, which is here, this is going strong at the moment, the Large Hadron Collider, they know what they're looking for, at least they think they know what they're looking for. So before the beams come out, all the data comes out, I'm just one button up, the way that came out, come out of the, this is the CMS detector, out of that detector, 99.9% .9 of the data has been discarded. And the banks of computers taking out those data, because if it didn't, it swamps the World Wide Web in five seconds. Uh, so they take that out, so they think they know what they're looking for. The other facilities don't know what they're looking for, and therefore can't do the same thing. And this gives you a view of how they take it out. They start with raw data, they take out a lot of stuff on the way, and by the time you finish, you end up with all the researchers around the world creating about 50 petabytes. As I said, that would be thousands of times more of that if, if they didn't take those data out. So they have a different issue. But there, this is where the experts are. Why we invent the wheel? If, if you've got uh, centers like that in around the world that know how to deal with these massive data sets. And this data explosion is predicted by everybody. This is the European Space Agency's predictions of how data will uh, arise and these are other predictions. They're all going up exponentially. And this is the, in, in the area which we've got to work in. And in 2009, the Commission made these important statements about the importance of e-science will force this paradigm shift. And it's crucial that you get this right. And uh, last year, I said this little group, which is a so-called high-level group on the future of scientific data. 
and we produce this book, report called Guiding the Way, the Tsunami of Data Deluge. And what we're talking about, because it's now about global collaboration, wherever you are, you can be part of this. And it's there, and to take forward, all these experiments are very much around the grand challenges facing society, wherever they may be. And it isn't just driven by Europe, this is driven all around the world. There are similar organizations. I've just been in Canada, I was sitting in Australia, New Zealand earlier this year, and I've been to the States earlier this year as well. All of us are talking about this issue together, how we can work together, a common language, collaboratives. And this is where it becomes the point.